What do you think of when you hear the word blood? <laughs> Raise your hand if you say vampires. Look, the, they're clustered together in the back. The blood suckers. And they're in the dark. Oh, nice crystal. Very good observation. <clears throat> what color? What color's blood? All right. See, I disagree with the book, and this is why. Because I want to make it easy on you. Blood in your arteries. Now, we're going to change this later when we learn some more specific stuff. But out in the body in your arteries, blood is typically red. Do you know why? Correct. Because it's mixed with oxygen. When it's oxygen rich, it turns red. We'll talk about why later on. What color is blood in your veins? It is bluish. How many people believe that? Look at your wrist. Go like this and look at your wrist. Now, depending upon your skin tone, you may bend it. Do it like that. And let's look right here. Uh, look right there. We can see right there. That's a vein under your skin. What color does it appear to you? Yeah. So if you look at your wrist, and, you know, if your skin's darker, just grab the nearest white person that's really pale and look at their wrist, okay? And what you will see is blueness in there. Yeah, you can also look on the back. If you are jaundiced at all, yellow and blue make green, so it'll look green, and your blood's not really green, so... So we got blood that's red and blood that's blue. And we'll discuss that a little bit later. Blue means low in oxygen. We say deoxygenated. It is never empty, guys. When I first start teaching this to people and they hear blood, they say, it's got oxygen or it doesn't have oxygen. No, it's higher or lower. It's never empty. Even at rest, and you don't have to write this number down. <laughs> Every other number you'll have to write down, but not this one. Even at rest, you're or at rest, your blood in your veins is still 75% full of oxygen. Isn't that crazy? But we'll learn that number later on. The pH of blood, 7.35 to 7.45. What does that mean? Can't be neutral because only 7.0 is called neutral. It's, Clay, what is it? <laughs> it's slightly basic. It is slightly basic, guys. See, 7.0 is neutral. Anything above that is basic. At the beginning, it's slightly basic, and then it gets more and more and more basic. It has to be under 7 to be acidic, to be truly acidic. It has to be under 7. Your blood doesn't go that low. Normally, it stays between 7.35 and 7.45. Temperature of blood is about 100.4. We don't use centigrade. We use Fahrenheit in here because, you know, body temperature is 98.6. But I bet some of you run cold. Raise your hand if you know you run cold. See, I thought it would be those blood people at the back, but it's not. Pardon? <laughs> I'm leaving that alone. All right. Volume of blood. Who has the most blood in the room? I'm picking Stephen. I'm picking Stephen. That's who I'm picking. See, males have on average five to six liters. Females have on average four to five. So I just usually say the average is five liters. Males a little more. Women a little less. Why? That's it. It's muscle. It's muscle mass. It's lean body mass. Girls have typically, genetically, the way that we're made is women have more adipose tissue. You need that, by the way. You need more to make your hormones. Okay? In fact, if your body fat drops too much, you'll quit making those hormones in normal amounts and you'll stop your period. 
and you'll lose bone density and all kinds of other stuff that's not really great for you. Okay. I don't worry about the body weight percent. You can see it, but I've never asked anybody that. I don't plan on asking you that. What are the main parts of blood? Plasma and formed elements. Why do we call them formed elements in science instead of just blood cells? Because as we're going to see on the slide in just a bit, white blood cells are the only true blood cells. The other two are not complete cells when they're mature. Okay. However, I will almost always say blood cells. You're not going to hear me say informed elements all the time. You'll hear me say in blood cells. You know what that means. We'll discuss them as blood cells. I would like for you to give me some functions of blood. I will put the slide away so you can't read. And then I will bring it back in a little bit. Number one function, yeah, that we think of should be to transport oxygen. That's what I would think. But is good, somebody, I heard you say it. Is oxygen the only thing that's transported through the blood? What else is transported? Carbon dioxide hormones. What else? Metabolic weights. Enzymes. Electrolytes. Question number what from the test? Right? You remember that. It asked you to name three different categories of things that are transported through the plasma or that are part of the 2%. That's what we're talking about now. The 2% of the plasma, that's other solutes, electrolytes and waste and gases and nutrients and hormones slash enzymes, okay? All of those are transported. See? Right here. So one of the major functions of blood is transportation. You don't have to say distribution. You can say transportation. Or there's probably other words that I would accept, too. I'm not trying to make you mimic every word I say. I just want you to think about it and put it in your own words most of the time. Well, in your own words and fancy AMP words, too. Oop, gave you a preview. Who's looking? The next functions can be grouped together under the main term of regulating or maintaining homeostasis. See, the people that read the book already know this because it's in the book. Name some things that the blood regulates. Body temperature. pH level. And yes, you were right. You said blood pressure. Well, blood is used to regulate blood pressure, so fluid volume. But I'm not going to focus on that so much because we talk about hormones regulating that, and they use certain mechanisms to do that, but blood volume is a way that that's regulated. I like to focus on body temperature and pH. pH needs to stay between what normally? 7.35 and 7.45. Take a wild guess what happens if it drops to 7.3. Negative feedback kicks in and it tries to go back up, right? Actually, it doesn't even wait till it gets to 7.3, to be honest with you. It would kick in before that. And the last function fit under the umbrella of protection. And when we think of this, it's very easy to think of white blood cells protecting us. Would you agree? What do they do? Sure, so a generic way to say that would be they fight infections, right? No matter what it's from, they fight infections. The other two bullets that are there under infection, we'll get to in the immune system. I'm not too worried about those right now because I don't like to talk about stuff before we get there if it's technical. And that's still a little technical for the moment. However, I will jump to this next one, which is higher. Blood actually protects you from losing blood. What part of blood protects you from losing fluids out of your cardiovascular system? Platelets. That's their job. They clot. And by clotting, they are protecting you from fluid loss. 
plasma protein part, I'll explain in a little bit. And it does it as well. So there we have it. The functions of blood basically fit under three categories. All you have to do is think of the cell, the three kinds of cells, and plasma, and you got it made. Plasma is made of water. Water, as we learned last time, changes its temperature rather slowly, so it regulates body temperature. And then we got white blood cells for infection, platelets for clotting, and red blood cells transport oxygen, so that makes us think of transports everything. So you've got all your functions right there when you just think about the parts of blood. It's pretty cool, realistically. Now I can cruise really fast real quick because we know this. Blood is what percent plasma? 55. And that leaves what percent for the cell? 45, correct. But we're going to talk about plasma first. Plasma is 90% water. Notice what I said. Plasma, which is a little over half of your blood, is 90% water. Your blood is not 90% water. Only the plasma portion is. Your blood is almost 50% what? Cells. It's almost 50% cells. Okay? It's really close to 50-50. It's not exact 45, 55. It can vary. Now, we learned on the sheet that 8% of the plasma is formed or formed of these things called plasma proteins. And plasma proteins are produced by the liver. You already know something about plasma proteins. But I want to make sure that you know what you know, so you know how it goes. Get a draw, no picture. What is this? Yep, it's a cute little capillary. Oh, that's right. Well, that's how Dr. Pearson, my pathology teacher, said it. She said capillaries and skeletal. Skeletal? Skeletal? What am I putting in there? <laughs> nope, nope, nope. What am I putting in there? Nope. Nope. Ah, who said proteins? Yeah, plasma proteins. Of course, from your angle, that looks like hormones, and it looks like blood cells. And it, but I'm just telling you, I'm putting the proteins there. I want you to see them. Does it look like solutes? Wow. Anything that's dissolved in a liquid is considered a solute. What does solute do? Hope that didn't offend anybody. Solute sucks. What's it suck? Water. It sucks water. Therefore, the first plasma protein, which you saw, 60% of the plasma proteins are albumins, which happens to be the protein in egg whites, by the way. Its job is to function as a solute that's inside of the blood vessel. It's too big to get out most of the time, and it helps to keep water in here. Why? Because it creates a concentration that's great enough that the water does not escape. It might push against the vessel, but it's not leaving. At least not most of it. You know, some will go out and some will come back in. We'll talk about that later on. All blood vessels. I'm just doing a capillary because that's what I like to draw. And really, because capillaries are the only place it escapes, right? Unless you have a hole in your arteries, it doesn't leave your arteries or your veins. 36% are called this. Globulins. I don't know. Have you ever heard that word before? What's TBG? Yes, sir, thyroxin binding globulin. Anybody remember what it does? Excellent. It binds to your thyroid hormones in the blood. Binds to your thyroid hormones in the blood. Remember, thyroid hormones are non-steroids, but they act like steroids in the way that they travel. They travel bound to plasma proteins. The plasma protein that they happen to be bound to is called a TBG. 
thyroxin binding globulin. So tell me, generically, what do globulins do? They transport things in the blood. Excellent. See how I use a mental hook that I already taught you? The reason I teach you about TBGs is so that you'll be ahead of the game when you get to blood. It would be harder if you never heard it before. Now, this is new. There's a whole other class of protein that fit within the globulin category. And they are known as immunoglobulin. We don't usually say that. We usually give them a simpler name. We call them antibodies. The question then that I'll ask is what kind of chemical are antibodies? What kind of molecule? What kind of chemical? That's what I mean. They're a plasma protein, right? Did you see? See how it's so easy to forget what we're studying right now? What are we studying? Plasma proteins. So all of these things that I'm mentioning right now are what? They're protein. They're protein. Antibodies are protein molecules. Travel in the blood. They may be released and go places. And you have white blood cells that make them too that we'll talk about a little bit later on. But these are your globulins, transporters and antibodies. You ever heard of gamma globulin? That's what that is. It's an antibody. And then, lowly 4 percenter fibrinogen. Fibrinogen. This is the first time this semester that I get to say this. I'll get to say it a lot. When a chemical ends with ogen, it typically means that it's inactive. Typically means it's inactive. Only 4% of your plasma proteins are this. Fibrinogen is the protein that will eventually turn into the framework or the mesh behind a what, do you know? A blood clot. Or just a clot. We don't have to say a blood clot because it doesn't have to be, you know, in the blood vessel. It can be where you have a cut or something as well. And it does trap the blood cells in it and other things. And these actual fibers that you see, these are the active portion of fibrinogen, and when fibrinogen gets activated, it simply drops its ending. And we call it fibrin. Why would the clotting protein be inactive in the blood? Otherwise, your vessels would all be full of clots, and we wouldn't survive very long if that were the case. So it needs to be inactive. What do you think activates it? Yeah, but I like this answer over here, a cut. Somebody said a cut. When you get cut, when you have tissue damage, damage to either the lining of the vessel or the outside of the vessel, Something happens, which we'll talk about at the end of this chapter, or you may be actually listening to Integrity about it, and it activates fibrinogen. It then, remember how I said these were solutes? Albumin solutes, globulins are solutes, you know, they're dissolved particles. Fibrinogen is a dissolved particle, but then when it becomes fibrin, it actually takes form and becomes a very solid rope-like structure. And we will actually see pictures of it a little bit later in the chapter. It's really cool looking. All right. And that's the plasma protein.
We know this. That's what plasma, that's the 2%. The 2%. Hormones, enzymes, gases, electrolytes, nutrients, and waste products like urea and creatinine, lactic acid. We'll talk about these things more later. Okay, here's a slide that has the info for you. The reason that we don't just say cells is because red cells and platelets are not complete cells. A red blood cell has what shape? Biconcave disc. And why does it have that shape? Because its nucleus has been ejected. It's lost its nucleus. It's lost its organelle. It puckers in in the center and it gets a new shape. Therefore, it's no longer actively making anything. It's a sack of chemicals. That is not considered a living cell at that moment. It's just a sack of chemicals that used to be a cell. Even though in this PowerPoint you'll see red blood cells die. You know, well, they're really not living, but, you know, they were alive. They lost their nucleus. I don't know. It's, you know. Platelets are just tiny fragments of a big cell. They kind of peel off of it. They like to use the analogy when blood flows through by this cell, they kind of peel off like stamps. You know, the pre-pressed stamps that are on, that are already sticky, you can just peel them right off. That's what they use, but, of course, they're tiny and microscopic. As we learned, red blood cells spend their whole life in the blood, unless you get cut. But the others, well, the white blood cells, roam around through the tissues. So they are only in the blood for a very short time. And blood cells are produced where? In the bone marrow, which color? The red one red bone marrow. The yellow bone marrow is inactive. It's fatty. Okay. Uh, boy, how easy is this slide now? What are these? What are those? What kind of white cell is this? What about this one? And what about this little horseshoe? Look at you go. What if I had one that was here that had big blue dots? What if I had a red one with sunglasses? But of course, we don't have those. We've seen them before. Red blood cells. Everything you wanted to know about a red blood cell, but we're afraid to ask because it's got way too many numbers. Oh, my goodness. Can't teach red blood cells without going number crazy. Hopefully, you know all the numbers on the blood lab sheet already. That'll make this easier for you. If you don't, you get a second chance, right? Everything on that sheet is fair game. Everything in that talk is fair game for lecture. Keep that in mind. That's how we do this. I'll go fast on the stuff you know. Red blood cells are shaped like a biconcave disc because it lost its nucleus. That's why they say a nucleate, and essentially there are no organelles, no ribosomes left, no mitochondria. That means no protein synthesis in there. It has already created what it needs to live its next hundred or so days, which we'll talk about in just a bit. It is full of hemoglobin, roughly 90%, 97% of the material inside of it is hemoglobin. There's other chemicals as well, though. A red blood cell, since it was a complete cell, it still has a cell membrane. Remember, cell membranes are made from what kind of material? Phospholipid bilayer with some proteins embedded in it as well. Lots of proteins, to be honest with you. One of the proteins in the plasma membrane is called spectrin. It is special because it gives them flexibility. You may just happen to remember. Oh, I don't, I don't think I have it there. You may just happen to remember on that blood PowerPoint. Did you see that blood PowerPoint? I thought it was on the other computer that I got it out today, so it's not here. Did you guys see that picture that had the red blood cells on the tip of the needle? Anybody download that? I know that you printed it out. 
And then there's another one that's got red blood cells going single file through a capillary. That's, oh, that's okay. Because then I'd have to open my email and all that. Yeah? Okay. So that's good enough. Anyway, red blood cells squeeze single file through capillaries. They're supposed to get squeezed. But eventually, since they can't repair the membrane, eventually the membrane rips apart when they get squeezed down. And that usually happens in the spleen. The spleen is made so that it can handle and recycle the dead red blood cells or the destroyed red blood cells. That's pretty cool. You guys remember when you were kids? Okay, you remember when you were babies? How many people remember when they were a baby? How many people remembered when they were a baby when they were 15? Anybody? I don't remember when I was 15, so anyway. Don't babies usually put their feet in their mouth? Yeah, y'all all did it, you know. You don't remember it, but you did. I can see you now, Stephen, with your feet, you know, all curled up, you know. So, how many 80-year-olds you see doing that? How many 80-year-olds you think can get a toe in their mouth? You know? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So we don't want to think about that. But the whole point is, as people age, they get less flexible. As red blood cells age, they do the same thing. However, you know, people can still repair. Red blood cell can't. So when it does the splits, it's over. It's dead. It's done. The other thing is, wow, red blood cells are the number one factor contributing to the thickness, technical word is viscosity, of blood. Red cells are. This is quite logical, but I do want to explain it to you. How much thicker, how much more viscous is blood than water? Three and a half to five times on average. It's three and a half to five times thicker than water. It's not just a saying about your family, blood is thicker than water. It is actually true. How's blood thicker than water? Well, is water plus a whole bunch of stuff, correct? It's got some dissolved proteins, it's got other solutes, and it's got almost half of it are cells. So blood is thick. And because half of your blood is blood cells and the red cell count is so much higher than any of the other cells, the red cells are the major contributor to the thickness of blood. Right there. So if your red cell count goes up, your blood gets thicker. If it goes down, your blood gets thinner. There's the picture, biconcave disc. What's that do for the cell? Okay, so I, it's a little tweak. It really has about the same surface area as when it was a big cell, but now it's in a very small area, right? So for its size, it has a great surface area, which allows it to get more oxygen in. than just a, another cell that might be round in that size. Got that. We got that. We got that. This makes sense if you think about it. What's the main job of red blood cell? Carry oxygen. So should it use the oxygen it's carrying? No, it shouldn't, and it doesn't. Red blood cells have no mitochondria, they go through anaerobic respiration, which we'll talk about later. That means they do not use ATP. I mean, sorry, they don't use oxygen in the production of ATP. This is a brilliant example of how structure and function are related because of what it's got on the inside and what it does and what it's missing and what it carries and how it doesn't use what it's carrying. That's just amazing. I like this bullet right here. You can tell I, I like doing blood a lot differently than I do endocrine. I'm cool going with the PowerPoint and blood. Not so much on endocrine system. Why would hemoglobin bind reversibly with oxygen? See, that's perfect. That's, if it didn't, that means it would never let it go. If it binds irreversibly, like carbon monoxide, that's what comes out of the tailpipe, right? 
when that binds with oxygen, it's locked with oxygen and you can't get it off of, of the, sorry, it doesn't lock with oxygen. It locks with the hemoglobin and it blocks oxygen and you can't get it off unless you go in a hyperbaric chamber and increase the pressure, the concentration of oxygen to get it off. Oxygen, however, binds to the hemoglobin and travels. Doesn't it need to leave and go to a cell? That's the whole point. We don't put it in blood so the blood can have it. We put it in the blood to get it to the cells. So it has to be able to bind reversibly. It has to be able to let go. And red blood cells don't just carry oxygen. They also carry carbon dioxide. Wow. They carry CO2 as well. I like the picture better than the words on this. This is a hemoglobin. What do you see right here? And here. And here. What's it look like? Well, it looks weird. It looks like soft serve ice cream that wasn't dipped just right. I mean, I don't, I don't know what it looks like. Anyway, I'll tell you what these are. These are four separate little proteins. Instead of protein, we really call them polypeptides. But I don't get so hung up on that in here. It's not biochemistry. So that's like four different protein chains. Therefore, hemoglobin is an organic molecule. It's mostly protein. Watch me zoom up on it, though. You see, right in the center of each of these proteins, there's a little disc that looks like a flying saucer. That is called a heme group. Ah, the protein part's called the globin. You got to keep that different from globulin, but now you're seeing when we have glob and globe, that means protein. The heme portion, well, let's look at it. It's right here. They blew one up for us. What does this conjure up in your mind? You gotta be proud when you say it out loud. Alright, I heard somebody say glucose. That's fair enough. Look at the shape. These aren't glucoses, but that's what we learned that kinda of has that shape, right? And I like your thought process because this is an organic molecule. Anywhere we see these junctions, there's carbons with hydrogens sticking out on them. So that means this is a big, huge organic molecule. My other class was saying, looks like a honeycomb. Looks like, uh, I don't know, all kinds of crazy stuff. Chicken wire fence. But anyway, it's an organic molecule. What's in here? Each one of these carries one iron in the center. You want to take a wild guess what that iron does? That's the part that carries oxygen. The iron-containing heme group is the oxygen carrier. It carries it on the iron. And this is how much it carries. Each hemoglobin, tell me, how many hemes does it have? Four, one for each of the proteins. So each hemoglobin, individual molecule, can actually carry four O2s. Now, this is where I'm about to hit you with the numbers. You've got to put your brain on. Do you remember how many hemoglobins per red blood cell? 250 million. How would you write that? Would I stop there? Right? Because last time you checked your bank account, you saw that many zeros, right? Just hope they weren't in front of all this. This tells us that one RBC that's full of that many hemoglobins, which each carry that, has the potential to carry one billion O2s. That's every single red blood cell in your body. And that's lowballing it, really, because actually 
probably the hemoglobin count is closer to 300 million, but I like this because it gives us a nice round 1 billion. So, you know, it's not the 100% truth. It may be for some people. But they say 280 to 300 is probably a more accurate count on that, on the million. Wow. Each red blood cell, a billion oxygens. How many red blood cells in this much blood? This is at me. Look at me. How big is that? It's a perfect millimeter cubed. Well, it's really not, but that's what I'm trying to get you to see. How many red blood cells in one millimeter cubed? In one millimeter cubed, we have five million red blood cells. Wow. How many of those millimeters cubed do you have in your whole body worth of blood? Well, here's what you got. You got enough to do this. The human being is made up of 75 trillion cells. How many is Shaq made of? More. Do you know how many are red blood cells? One third of all your cells in your body are red blood cells. That means 25 trillion. Trillion has how many zeros? Twelve. Big T for trillion. Big T for twelve. That's a crazy amount. So you want to do the numbers? You want to run by these numbers? Twenty-five trillion red blood cells, each carrying one billion oxygens. Therefore, you can carry, if all of your red blood cells were full, twenty-five times 10 to the 12 plus 9 to the 21st power O2s. Holy moly, Batman. That's a lot of oxygen. 21 zeros after that 25. That's 0.25 times 10 to the 23rd, which is getting really close to Avogadro's number if you're a chemistry person. That's a lot. That's a lot, a lot, a lot. I won't ask you that, but I might ask you any of those other numbers that you see up there, okay? You've had time to digest those numbers. Hopefully, you learned them. you got to own the difference between a red cell, white cell, and platelet count. I'll cover that again, but you need to know how many hemoglobins in a red cell, how many oxygens are carried by one hemoglobin, and what that means and how we can do some little calculations with that, all right? Kind of a big deal on that. Do you think that men and women have the same red blood cell count? No. Men, higher. See the arrow pointing up? That means the red cell count's higher. Females, red cell count is lower. There's still usually between 4 and 6 million. You know why that's cool? Because the blood amount is between 4 and 6 liters, and the cell count's between 4 and 6 million. So that's pretty cool. I don't get so particular and exact, but that's close enough. Because the book will give all kinds of crazy little detailed numbers with decimals and stuff. Hey, do you have a, a scale or a scope of how much that really is? Well, you see, that's what my question was going to be. If you could count to 75 trillion, but you could only count one number every second. I know one of you smarties is going to say this, but how long would it take you to get there? 75 trillion seconds. Okay, big whoop. How long 75 trillion seconds? Is it a week? Is it a day? Is it a month? Is it a year? How many pluses? Here's what it is, guys. You should be able to know metrics enough to calculate this or know that dimensional analysis stuff. But anyway, I'll just show you. Cut to the chase. It's 2.3 million years worth of seconds. When we hear the word trillion and we think we understand it, wrap your brain around that. 75 trillion is 2.3 million years worth of seconds. Wow. That's a big deficit. Man. 
Okay, enough of that. Let's move right along. We won't even say that when it's so scary. We'll just start all over. We already talked about that. Love it. Hemoglobin. Where is the O2 carried? On the iron containing heme group. When the hemoglobin is full of oxygen, when your red blood cells are loaded with oxygen, we call the hemoglobin oxyhemoglobin because it's full of oxygen. How logical is that? When it dumps its oxygen, now the hemoglobin produces a different color, right? It turns blue, and it's called deoxyhemoglobin. Well, what I hinted at earlier but didn't totally tell you is that the globin portion carries CO2. The little sausage-looking chains carry some CO2. And when CO2 is being carried by the hemoglobin instead of the oxygen, we call it carbamino hemoglobin. Using your vast knowledge of the scientific world, tell me why they call it carbamino. Okay, because we're talking about carbon dioxide and it's carried on what part of the hemoglobin? The protein, which is made up of amino acids. See how it works? The more you understand, the more you start to understand, the more these crazy big words actually make some sense, which is really neat and really cool. Okay, and before we go to break, we'll do this last slide, and we'll take a break. An official, actual, real break. What a concept in this three-hour night class. Carbon dioxide is transported through the blood in three ways. Three primary ways. You need the numbers. I, I'm just being honest with you. I never do as many numbers in any other chapter as I do in the blood chapter, but I will pound you with the numbers in this chapter. Because it numbers give you scope. They give you some relationship. 7% of your carbon dioxide is simply dissolved in the plasma. That's not much, okay? That means most of your CO2 is not dissolved in the plasma. It's carried another way. Almost a quarter, about 23%, is carried like we just talked about on the hemoglobin, on the amino acid part, on the globin chain, and we call that carbamino hemoglobin. So almost a quarter is carried that way. Probably on these, I'm probably not going to make you spit out the exact percentage, but you definitely got to know a little kind of in the middle and a whole bunch on this. You know, I might say which one carries 70%. I probably won't ask you to name the percentages, though. This one, however, is so important that we will revisit this at least five times this semester. This is a formula. 70% of your carbon dioxide is transported through your blood as a bicarbonate ion, HCO3 negative. You may remember that's the major chemical buffer in the body. It was mentioned in AMP1. And here's how it works. In the blood, carbon dioxide and water come together. See that plus? That's what that means. Carbon dioxide and water come together. And they form this which is called carbonic acid, which, don't worry, we'll see it later. Hey, what allows chemical reactions to take place fast enough for life to occur? Enzymes. Do you think there's a catalyst or enzyme that helps this happen? Of course there is. I'll, talk, I'll tell you about it later on. But then, anyway, this carbonic acid dissociates. That's what acid do when they're in solution. They separate out, and we get hydrogen ions that are free, remember that's an acid. Hydrogen ions make something acidic. The more of them there are, the lower the pH goes. I'll say that a billion times this semester. Okay, maybe not a billion, maybe a hundred. 
and then we also get these bicarbonate ions. So you can see the CO2 is hidden in here, in this part, in this HCO3 negative, the bicarbonate ion. Later, we'll see where it happens, not in this chapter. This is your first initiation into it, so I just make you memorize the formula. And we start doing relationships with it in respiratory and urinary and water balance and stuff like that. And then eventually we get real fancy with it. But for right now, we'll stay just the basics. Most CO2 is transported in the blood as what? Bicarbonate. And there's a big formula you've got to know that comes with it. CO2 joins what and eventually becomes bicarbonate? Water. It joins water. Okay? The second most, which is only a quarter of it, is transported on the what molecule? On the hemoglobin. On what part of it? The globin chain, which is made up of proteins which are amino acids. So what do they call that? Carb amino hemoglobin. And only a little baby amount, 7%, is dissolved in the plasma. 